Good morning, and it's a great honor for me to speak to you about this book,、um, and also about my personal experiences, the stories,、um, and thoughts on the book.、Um, I've been enjoying reading this book very much,、um, and I can relate to、uh, Kingston in many different ways.、Um, his her struggle and、uh, conflict、um, of assimilating to American culture、um, while trying to maintain her. Um, Chinese cultural heritage.、Um, so before I start, I want to I want to introduce some、uh, background on the on the book. So the book is about Kingston's childhood memories, which dated from 1940 to about 1960s, during which time China was undergoing communist revolution.、Uh, as you can tell from the book.、Um, Although her family lived in U.S.,、um, you can still tell that they were living under the shadow of this revolution. And at that time, many Chinese immigrants they escaped the unrest in in China and came to U.S. to work a, as laborers.、Um, but it has been 70 or to 80 years after what happened in the book, and China has experienced great social and economic change since then,、um, especially in my generation. Um, I grew up eating McDonald's and listening to、um, English pop music and watching Hollywood movies.、Um, and like, especially in the 70s, uh, China uh, introduced this opening up policy, and、uh, it began to embrace the the Western culture, and、uh, um, also involving a lot of、uh, trade, international、uh, business and trade、uh, with a, a lot of Western countries. So、uh, a lot of themes emerging from the book, like ghosts,、uh, Chinese traditions, family,、um, gender, and voice, silence, identity. And I selected the last chapter, "Song for a、uh, Barbarian Rape Pipe."、Um, and from this chapter, I would like to talk about、um, three common themes, which is voice versus silence, gender, and Identity.、Um, so first, I would like to talk about voice and silence. That's the the, the most、uh, significant theme in this chapter. So、um, in this chapter,、um, so the author she has she had trouble、um, talking to people when she was a kid,、um, and she physically abused a mute girl in school,、um, which shows that her own frustration about her. Inability to to speak, and later on she found that the verbal expression、um, is actually a sign of sanity.、Um, but in Chinese culture, we do encourage people,、uh, especially kids, to to be quiet, to be to be shy, especially for girls. So one is expected to listen, to obey, rather than to express their own opinions,、um, and.、Uh, We keep silent because, first of all, because of language.、Um, and、uh, I've seen a lot of studies、uh, show that language is the biggest barrier for some Chinese、um, immigrants or Chinese international students、uh, in U.S. for their social interaction, for their adaptation,、uh, and also fear. Like in the book,、uh, her mom talked about how the Chinese community they. They keep silent because they want to avoid a lot of、uh, attention and trouble,、um, and also because of、uh, weakness, they don't think they have power. They don't think people will listen to their voice, so they keep silent. And、um, you know, Chinese culture is greatly influenced by Confucianism, and Confucianism is about living in harmony. That's the key philosophy.、Um, So,、uh, living in harmony with other people, with nature, and uh, with uh, the society. So we have Chinese old sayings, like a tree, a tall tree catches the wind, and suffering is a blessing. So, a lot of times when we suffer, when we feel like we are unfairly treated, we keep silent. We don't want to argue, or we don't want to challenge, because we think. Blessing, we blessing, suffering is a blessing, 
And we think if you, we speak up, we may draw attention to ourselves, which is a bad thing. But um, voice is actually one of the biggest lessons I've learned since I came to US. I think, and also the author, Kingston, she realized later that voice is, uh, is power. It gives you power, and it helps you earn respect from, from other people. I, myself, uh, have learned to, to speak up a lot of times since I came here. And next, I want to share some, some of the examples and my stories about <coughs> speech, about speaking up. So if you are following the news, you may know this uh, act, SCA5. Um, this act it was introduced by Californian State Senator Edward Hernandez on December 3rd, 2012, to ask voters to consider eliminating ban on the use race, sex, color, ethnicity, and rec recruitment admissions and retention programs in California's public schools and universities. Um, so what do you think? that will have impact on Chinese community in California. There will be a huge impact. Um, California has the largest Chinese community in the US. And since the introduction of the ban on race in admissions in university, um, Chinese, uh, Chinese students' enrollment in universities has surged. Um, but if this act, SCA5, is approved. Um, so you can pre-see that uh, a lot of Chinese students, they will lose their access to universities, not because they are not qualified, but because they are Chinese. So that's why this act has caused a strong uh, oppos opposition from Asian American community. Um, so it has been going on for a very long time. And recently, this bill was withdrawn. Um, so it was considered a, a success from the Asian American community because their, um, their willingness and their will to, to step up and to speak up for their own right for education and equality. So this is a picture where um, thousands of uh, uh, Chinese Americans, they uh, protest, protested against this act and they were um, on the streets and with these um, posters. And they also signed, signed a, a petition on the White House page, the change.org. Um, and uh, within a very short time, uh, they collected over 100,000 signatures from the community. And the White House had to make a, a statement about this petition. Um, another case is the kids' table in Jim, Jimmy Kimmel's show. So Jimmy Kimmel had a round table discussion with a group of kids about US uh, 1.3 1, 1 trillion debt to China. And he asked the kids what they should do about the debt. And one kid answered, kill everyone in China. I was actually watching this show when, when it was aired. And um, I felt a little bit of offensed by uh, what the, the Jimmy Kimmel said, and also the kid said. But uh, I understood that it was a show, it was for entertaining, and they, they are just kids. So I didn't think too much. Until later, I saw on Chinese Twitter, it's called Weibo, and a, a woman, a mom in California, she posted, um, I feel very upset. I was crying for days because my son in school um, uh, there was a boy in my school who came to my son and said, kill everyone in China. That's when I realized how big impact this show had made um, on the kids. And later on, a lot of, I'll say, opinion leaders, Chinese opinion leaders on Chinese Twitter, on Weibo, they began to organize um, protests ag ag against this uh, Jimmy Kimmel show. Um, so over 1,000 Chinese Americans gathered in front of ABC headquarters and protested against the show. And in every state, uh, you can see that people gather around and uh, protesting against the show. And also, they signed up this petition to fire Jimmy Kimmel um, and collected over 
100,000 signatures. So the White House had to make a statement. Of course, uh, the result is that um, Jimmy Kimmel was not fired because you can still see his show. Um, but the ABC headquarters, they had to make several press releases about uh, 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 this show and they apologized to the Chinese community several times and they canceled the kids table, the segment permanently um, just to avoid any other um, the, the, uh, the Chinese people's uh, feelings. So this is the picture of the Chinese people um, protesting against Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Kimmel show. So these two protests are the, the biggest and the most organized protests I've seen um, during my time in US. And Chinese community, they, they are known for keeping silent, right? Especially in the book. But right now there is a change. Um, they realize that they are part of the, the country even though they are minority, but they need to speak up for their own rights. And uh, in that way, their voice can be heard. And uh, then people respect. So both of the protests, um, there are some um, very positive results. And for my, from my own experiences, I am also finding my voice um, during my time here. Uh, I remember first I came here, I was uh, at Penn, and in the classroom, um, it was a really hard time for me to adjusting because in China, as you know, uh, mostly we listen to the teachers and we just sit there. We don't say anything. Um, but in the classroom at Penn, um, everybody is encouraged to, to, to share their own opinions, and that was a big change for me. So, um, but at first I kept silent in class, not only because of the language, because I could express myself in English without a problem. Um, and I have, I have my thoughts too on something. Sometimes it just, it's not the way I'm used to, and sometimes I'm just, I'm too scared to, to, to say something in class. Um, I remember I was taking this anthropology class, and there are, there was, some uh, Asian students in that class and there are um, so we, we are masters and there were some PhDs students um, so it was very interesting because every every class you will see a pattern um, where, where the PhD students they take the lead in every discussion and they talk about their thoughts and they they, they, they argue with each other and some American masters they participate from time to time. And the Asian students, we are always listeners. And we barely sp spoke up. Um, and as you may see, some of the Asian students here in, at Canberra, and they ten tend to be um, shy and quiet in class. So that's the way we were taught uh, to, to show respect to the teachers, um, to, to listen. But uh, it has changed a lot. Um, so I forced myself to, to speak up, um, even though sometimes my, sometimes my uh, arguments were not convincing or even not impressive. But I felt like I was encouraged. I was, uh, I was uh, confirmed by my professor and other students that it's, uh, it's a good thing to do. So I felt like I, I that my opinions actually matter and people respect what I have to say. And that's a big change from a Chinese class, in the Chinese class to American class. And about challenging authority, uh, we had a, an online post for homework and I've seen student, students and professors, they argue with each other. And people will say, okay, professor, you, what you are saying is not quite convincing. Um, but in China, it's, it's about respect the teachers. You always listen to the teachers, and what they are saying is always right. Um, so this is the, the, also the equality. Uh, you are learning 
in this class. So the professor may also uh, are learning from you. So this is something different for me. Uh, even after I graduated, um, like in real life, um, sometimes if I feel I'm not fairly treated, I just say, I say what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking to people. I'm not afraid of uh, speaking up my own opinions, my own feelings anymore. Um, and uh, I stand up for my own rights. And it felt really good. Um, so what I've been doing in China is every time if I, if I encounter something unfair, I just keep silent. I know that if I complain and no one can listen and no one will fix it. So this is something new and different for me. And it's one of the most important lessons I learned here, that people respect my idea, um, my opinions, rather than ignore them. Um, and next, I want to talk about gender. Um, and in China, the, the traditional gender rules, and uh, it's, a, it's a patriarchal society. And the women are supposed to be feminine and silent and obedient. So we have an old saying, uh, a girl's merit lies in her ignorance. So women were not encouraged to, to receive higher education. Um, and the girls were taught through, through fear, right? One of the, the main themes is uh, ghosts. I remember when I was a, a, a kid, my mom will say, if you do this again, um, some ghost will come and take you away. So, so that's how we are taught to listen to the parents. We taught through fear, uh, and we taught to be caretakers. Um, uh, so the women, women are um, supposed to be the caretakers of the family, and their success is to have a good family and marry uh, a good husband to be a good wife and mom. But the gender rules ha has changed in, in modern days, especially after the one-child policy. Um, so if a girl is the only child in the family and she has more opportunity to receive um, education, the equal education a boy does. Um, so, so women are uh, enjoying more opportunities to be educated. And a lot of women, they have, they have jobs. Um, in universities there in China, there are more girls than boys, actually. Um, but still, I can feel that women are judged by their value in marriage market. I remember before I came to US, um, my parents, they are supportive. But they, they just asked me one thing. After I finish my master's degree, I either go back to China or find a job in the US. I cannot uh, have my PhD degree um, because they think if, I, if I'm a PhD, if I'm a doctor, then that will decrease my value in the marriage market because my pool for husband candidates will be narrowed down um, because I have to find someone smarter than me, which is hard. Uh, <laughs> And so there is a, a saying in, Chi in China that there are three genders. Um, there are women, men, and female PhD. <laughs> so they are considered the third gender. Well, at that time, I, I said yes to my parents. I won't have my PhD. Um, before I came here, I still thought that um, a successful marriage is more important than a successful career. Um, but after I came here, um, even though still I, I, I only have a master's, I don't have my PhD, but now I think that's a possibility, that's an option, that's not something that I won't do. Um, so, and this, and this time I went back to China for the spring break. Uh, I haven't seen my parents and uh, my relatives for almost three years, so I saw them and I talk about my life in the US and my, my job and my school. Um, and so they were listening. And 
all the questions they asked were about, do you have a boyfriend? Uh, <laughs> when are you going to find a boyfriend? When are you going to marry? You're 27. Um, so your cousins, your, your friends, and blah, 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 they all get married and with kids. And they seem really happy and successful. Um, and my parents, they are, I think they are the open-minded parents um, among all the Chinese parents. They didn't give me much pressure. Um, they just, for, for my whole life, they uh, let me choose what I like, what I want. Um, so I, I am grateful to, uh, for that. But still, I can feel the pressure from my other relatives. And still, they consider um, marriage is more important than your career or your, your, um, your life in uh, either in US or in China. And I, my uh, thoughts on, so before I came here, I feel like I still consider myself uh, a girl. And I think, I thought marriage is more important than, uh, than my career. But I'm transiting from thinking myself as a woman to an individual. Um, China is a, is a collectivism society, which means that you are not only yourself. You are part of the, the unit, your family, or the society. And you have responsibilities for others, especially for your family. A lot of things you do um, are for your family, for the country, for the society. And you have to take others, take others into consideration. But US, it's all about individualism. You, are, you have your freedom. You have your right to choose what, what kind of life you want. Um, you don't have to think about um, your family in a lot of decisions. Um, so that's why the Chinese culture requires one to be family oriented. You have to think about your family or your future family. Um, but here, it has this more open and free environment where I can develop myself as a, an independent individual. Um, so in, during my time here, um, especially um, at UPenn, I was inspired by a lot of people, especially the girls at UPenn. Um, for example, the student, the, uh, the Chinese student government, the, the chair, chairman uh, was a woman. Um, and she was one of my friends at Penn. And also, I have a lot of friends at Penn who started, um, for example, the TEDx Penn program, and also um, uh, Penn's Voice. It's a, it's a page where you can share um, your own stories um, to other, uh, your, your fellow classmates. Um, and they started a lot of uh, initiatives at Penn. And I've known some friends who, uh, women friends, who are successful entrepreneurs in the US. And recently, I read a book. Uh, it's called Lean Nin by uh, Sheryl, Sheryl Sandberger. She is the CEO of Facebook. Um, and she is one of the few executives um, in the 500 companies. Uh, I was great, greatly inspired by, by those women. It's not only in China, even in the US, there are few um, executives in the, the 500 companies um, for women than for men. So it's a universal phenomenon. Um, but uh, during my time here, I came to realize that um, everything is possible and gender should not be the barrier for you. Um, and you should consider yourself an individual, but not so much as a woman. So I want to share uh, one of my studies uh, at Penn. So my study, I had a field study about uh, Chinese international students. Uh, I only had six participants. So this study might be biased, um, but it's not representative, but I just want to share this. I think it's very interesting. So, I'm, so my qualitative study in a, at my graduate school at Penn, um, so I chose six participants 
three boys and three girls. They're all Chinese. <coughs> um, and my study shows that among Chinese international students, girls are actually more willing to adapt to American culture. And they demonstrate greater success in <coughs> cultural assimilation. And I analyzed and I asked them um, why. I, I, well, I was trying to find out the answers. And I found out that um, a lot of the Chinese students um, coming to US, the boys, um, most of them are uh, majoring in engineering or science. Uh, and a lot of the girls, they are in humanities. Um, so they are, uh, the girls' English skills are generally better than the boys. So they don't have the, the obstacle of uh, the language. So they, um, they tend to uh, make more friends with uh, their American classmates. And they like to talk to people. Um, and I asked them, do they want to stay in US after graduation? And all of the girls, they said yes. And the boys, only one boy said he would consider staying. Um, so the, the girls, they, the reason uh, they want to stay is that they think they have more freedom if they have a life or a job in US. If they go back to China, they will have to live the life their parents um, set up for them. For example, finding a stable and well-paid job and then find a boyfriend and get married. Um, and they have better social skills. Um, it's, um, it's, well, I asked them, like, do they have American friends? And a lot of the girls, they said they have many American friends and they hang out with them all the time. And the boys, they are um, less, re uh, they are less willing to make American friends. Um, and uh, they think that they are not welcome uh, among the American students. Um, for the leadership, that's what I talked about. The girls, they actually um, very, uh, take risks to, to, um, to do something they, they are really interested in. They started their clubs. They started their own initiatives, like the TED X Pen um, program. This was my friend, and she started this program. Um, and the major, that, that was the, the engineering and uh, the humanity majors. That also has something to do with their uh, cultural assimilation. Um, from my study and also my thesis, um, the cross-cultural adjustment is hard for Chinese international students because of maybe language. And that has something to do with their confidence to, to speak up and to, to adjust to American culture. But the girls are generally doing better than, than the boys. Um, so that was uh, also surprising to me. Um, and uh, last, I want to talk about identity. Um, so during my time here, it was a time of shaping my own identity as uh, a Chinese who is now living um, in US. So Chinese traditions are still very important to me. Um, I consider myself a traditional Chinese person. But at the same time, I'm working here and I'm living here and I've been enjoying my time here. I have to assimilate to American society. And that urge to assimilate um, also caused some conflict with my own Chinese identity. Um, and I've seen some patterns uh, in these three groups. So, so the Chinese community here, uh, some of them are first generation immigrants, and some of them are second generation. And some of them are like me, uh, international students who maybe became later on um, international employees. Um, and uh, for the second generation, um, they weren't born here, and they have no problem with their language. So they, they had a, um, a better time adjusting to the American society. And for the international students, um, 
they have a sense of uh, insecurity in their identity because after after graduation um, do they feel the urge to assimilate um, sometimes they don't know if they are going to stay or not and even for me right now um, I, I seem to have a, a stable life here but for any second my visa can be um, can be expired and then I have to go back to China and if I go back to China and there is what they call reverse culture shock and this time I went back to China during the, the spring break and I felt something about the reverse culture shock to the Chinese people I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Americanized so there was some difficulty communicating with them and we have uh, different opinions in a lot of different things but to American people I'm I may be still a Chinese so that that dilemma is is very hard um, and it has something to do with your desire whether you want to stay in US and become more Americanized or you want to go back so you can hold on to your Chinese heritage and that has that if you decided to maybe uh, become more adapted then you need to work on your your social interaction with American people and the language um, so for me uh, after so for me and a lot of uh, peop Chinese people here they constantly ask themselves where do I belong and how do Chinese people view me or how do American people view me? Um, so it's constantly, it's an ongoing process of your um, own Chinese heritage and the, the need or the urge to, um, to mingle into the, the American society. Um, and all, the, all those things, the gender, um, race, and culture um, in the book, they are intertwined to shape one's identity. Um, so I feel a lot of respect for the gender, the race, the culture. They all play a very important part in shaping my own identity and shape and um, in the Chinese community here in U.S. Um, well, that's about my uh, speech. And do you have any questions? Yes. Sylvia, one of the <coughs> One of the things that keeps coming up, especially early in the novel, is this concept, or early in the story, is this concept of talk story. Mm -hmm. um, it's used as a noun, as a, you know, as in a talk story, and I've actually heard Kingston use it as a verb during an interview, and I was just wondering what that concept of talk story has meant to you. Is it, is it something that's unique, still unique to a Chinese culture, or is it, you know, what do you think about that? Okay, uh, what do I think about the, the talk stories? Um, I, I can actually relate to, to that, that part in the book. Um, and I think a lot of the Chinese kids, when they were uh, kids, the parents passed on a lot of uh, folklores and stories to them. Um, as part of the, the Chinese culture um, learning, and also a lot of the stories, they uh, they are meant to, to teach the kids how to be how to behave and uh, how to how to listen and how to um, shape your own roles uh, as uh, as the Chinese, especially for for the girls. Um, I think I've heard a lot of stories about ghosts as well when I was a kid. That was a very big part of Chinese culture, um, and also I think. They use it as uh, a fear um, to make us to to listen and to be obedient. Um, and maybe there are something that they cannot explain. Um, and I constantly ask questions to them. And if they cannot explain, and they will come up with some folklores and stories um, for my questions. Yes. Um, another aspect that I've noticed about cultural assimilation is uh, religious adaptation. Mm -hmm. And I've always been curious, especially coming from China, 
what uh, issues or anything are there when it comes to adapting to another society, even coming to a Catholic school, coming to a predominantly Christian society? Mm -hmm. What's that like? That's a very good question uh, about adapting to the religions um, in U.S. Uh, China, we don't have a dominant religion. Buddhism is the is the biggest religion in China. Um, but a lot of Chinese people say, we don't have the religion, but we have faith. Our faith is Confucianism, um, which is true. I agree that Confucianism has influenced Chinese people significantly. Um, and this Confucianism is quite different from uh, American uh, culture and religions. But so, at some part, they share some similarities. Um, before I came to US, I actually, um, I, I was very interested in religion and philosophy. So um, I actually went to a Catholic church. But I, I w I'm not a Catholic person, but I still went to that church. Um, I was a member of the choir. And every weekend, we'll have some um, visit to the, the orphanage um, to do something good for, for the kids there. Uh, it just, for me, it was a volunteer opportunity. And uh, I admire the, the Catholic um, people there at the church. They are very kind and warm-hearted people. And uh, the only thing was that I was not raised to be religious or to be Catholic. And uh, when I first, the first day I came to US, uh, I was at the airport. And there was um, a, a Christian group in our school at UPenn. And they actually picked me up from the airport. Um, and then later on, I joined their fellowship every Friday night. Uh, and I listened to, to, to uh, their discussion about Bible. So I had my experience with the religions here. And I, I admire those people. And I think a lot of them are very good person. They are kind, um, and they are uh, very warm-hearted. Um, so I don't mind, personally, I don't mind exposing myself to those religions and explore uh, different people's uh, religious uh, choice. Yes? When you uh, went back to China for the break, mm -hmm. what did you Mm -hmm. Great question. So what, I, what have I noticed uh, when I went back to China during the break uh, after the, the three years? Um, I'll share a story. So I was, um, I was at the shopping mall with my mom. And we were trying to, to buy something. Um, and uh, there was uh, the things we were going to buy. Uh, it was a shirt. And it had some defect um, on it. So I was talking to uh, the manager whether we can um, have another one. And uh, he was saying s something like totally irrelevant. He was saying, OK, this is, uh, uh, this is a, a good one. And uh, we, uh, we have displayed it uh, for a lot of days. Um, and it, it, it is your size. Uh, and I was saying, we are just asking for another one. And he, he won't just listen. And then I argue with him, uh, like what I will do here. And he talked to me. He said, are you a PhD? <laughs> 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 um, I don't know why he said that, but maybe because the way I argue with him, that won't normally happen in China. Um, and especially, he didn't expect that from a girl, I think. Um, so I think the biggest thing is that the way my way of thinking um, has been influenced by American culture. Sometimes, if I feel I need something, I will say it, and I will argue with people if I think it's the reasonable thing to do. Um, but in China, especially from the, their expectation from a girl is to be obedient, right? And you 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 listen, and you won't argue too much. Um, so that that is the the biggest change I have noticed in me. Well, 
last question? Yes? You speak Mandarin, right? Mm-hmm. Has it changed at all during your time in the States? Um, does, the, does the language change for you? Um, yeah, actually, a little bit. When I went back to China, uh, one of my friends, uh, she said, my Mandarin is actually a little bit worse than before. <laughs> but uh, I think it's just sometimes the first few days when I got back, I had a hard time adjusting, switching the, between the languages. I had to remind myself that I'm in China now, and I have to speak Mandarin with people. Um, so at first, my way of thinking is still in English. So I first thought in English, and then I translated into Chinese. That's why my friend said it's a little bit weird to <laughs> listen to my Mandarin. Um, but I still I read Mandarin books. This time I went back, I bought a lot of Chinese books, um, the, the classics. So I still read Chinese literature. Um, I read Chinese newspaper. Um, and um, yeah, I still try to, uh, especially I'm a Mandarin teacher, I have to. Uh, I still try to uh, improve my Mandarin uh, and also um, improve my English at the same time. <laughs> All right. Thank you.